Hello there, my name is Andrew. It's great to have you here. Welcome to St. Matt's Online.
It is great that you're here at St Matt's Online. It might just be you at home, or you might be gathering with one other person, or there might be a whole gang of you that are gathering together. Or it might be that you're down at one of the uh, watch and worship services, gathering here for the first time in a little while. It's so good that these services have opened up again. Uh, if you are online, we'd love to hear from you, especially if you're in a gang there, uh, to hear who's there. And if you're new, well, welcome to St. Matt's Online. We'd love to hear from you too. And it'd be really helpful if you could use the Connect card uh, to get in touch with us. We'd love to get in touch with you through the week. But wherever you are, we're here today to come before God in prayer, in song, in listening to what he has said in his word, the Bible. And today we'll also be sharing together in the Lord's Supper. You know, the first people who heard 1 Peter read to them were gathered, well, they weren't gathered in a great big church building like ours here. Uh, they were scattered into diverse corners of a great big pagan empire. And so much of the letter is how about how, how you live in a place like that, this. Uh, today's section focuses on how you live in your relationships with people that you're close to and people that you're not so close to. I mean, any relationship can have its challenges. It can be difficult to navigate. But today we get to hear some profoundly practical guidance from God about how we can make our relationships work in ways that are not only good for ourselves, but also for others and can even bring glory to God. See, is it possible that the way you live in relationship with other people could show people something of the light and the hope that is available in the Lord Jesus? This last section of 1 Peter is going to be a great way of wrapping up this brilliant letter that Peter wrote. But before we get to prayer and the Bible, here's a heads up on what's happening at St. Matt's next Sunday and in the next little while. Uh, next weekend, it's the October long weekend, uh, so don't forget that Daylight Savings kicks in. And we've got an exciting Sunday planned. Uh, this year's Jazz Festival has been cancelled due to COVID-19 by the council. It's been replaced by an online event. But at St Matt's, in place of Jazz Church, which we've had over the last few years, we've got a really exciting day of music and story as we hear from Dave and Dewey Mana about his journey out of a dark place to a place that is just filled with light. Uh, so Dave, who's our music director, has pulled together a fabulous band. So next Sunday, there'll be lots of wonderful music here in the building and online. Uh, the way it'll work next Sunday is here in the building, we'll have a traditional watch and worship service at eight, and then at 10 a.m., 5 p.m., and at night church at 6.30, Dave and the band will be presenting out of the darkness, live here in the building. And there'll also be a pre-recorded version of Out of the Darkness that will broadcast online as well. Beyond next Sunday, uh, we'll be back to watch and worship services at the normal times we've been holding them, at uh, 8, at 10 in the morning, and then at 6.30 in the evening. And that pattern will continue through for the next couple of months, through to the second half of November, when we expect the, the construction work here on site uh, will be completed. Well, now we move to prayer and uh, Claudia is going to come and lead us in prayer. Hi, I'm Claudia. I'm a member of Night Church and I have the joy of leading us in prayer today. There's a lovely encouragement to pray in this week's Bible reading, which says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. So please join with me in praying to our caring Heavenly Father. Almighty God, maker and minder of all creation, we are in awe of you who names the stars and fills the seas, who rebukes storms, who raises and levels mountains. Lord, may our praises join the song of creation. 
the song of the sun, the skies, the trees, the hills and the hail. May we sing with the birds and wild animals as they proclaim your glory, your power, your creativity and your goodness. Father, forgive us, for in our indifference we rob you of this praise. You are worthy of more than the song of all of creation, and yet we are destroying your choir. Lord, give us ears to hear the groans of your creation. Give our leaders eyes to see the pain you see. Teach us active repentance that we may commune with you in creation's healing. Jesus, we eagerly await your return when your justice and your restoration will pour over creation like a mighty roaring river. Amen. God of all comfort and compassion, we know that you long to gather us as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And so we pray that you would enfold those who are lost and suffering in your loving kindness. Father, heal the sick, console the grieving, free the oppressed and bind up the brokenhearted in our midst, in our nation and in our world. We will now take some time to pray for the people on our own hearts who are in need. Lord, our world is crying out for a vaccine to COVID-19. We trust in your provision and your sovereignty. God, may you bless us with peace, unity and wisdom in our waiting. And may your nearness be no especially known to the sick, the grieved, the health workers and our leaders. Father, we lift up to you our mission partner, Philippine Missionary Fellowship. We pray for PMF and the people they serve that you would sustain them as they remain under one of the world's strictest and most brutally enforced lockdowns. We praise you, God, for the continuing ministry of PMF pastors during this pandemic, through preaching online, home visits, and even a limited Sunday church service. Thank you, Jesus, that the hope and light of the gospel shines even in the darkness. Father, with the new school year due to begin in the Philippines, Many poorer families can't access the materials, devices or internet needed for online learning. We pray that the government and schools be vessels of your generous provision and find a way to serve all students. And finally, Lord, we thank you for what a beautiful blessing our women's ministers, Suzanne Smith and Kelsey Wilson are to our church. We thank you for their love, their leadership, their wisdom and their witness. We pray that you will continue to fill them with grace as they help the women of St. Matt's to live and to love in ways that only make sense in light of the cross. We also pray for your blessing on their gorgeous families. And so to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Hi, my name's Barry Hammond and I'm one of the community chaplains at St Matthew's at Manly. The reading for today is 1 Peter chapter 5, all of the chapter. 1 Peter chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert 
and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be power for ever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as my faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Well, hello there. My name's Scott. I'm one of the ministers here. It's great to be with you today. If you could have your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 5, that would be especially helpful to me and hopefully to you as well. Now, nobody goes to the zoo on their own. You, you probably not thought about that uh, very hard. But you don't see people walking around the zoo solo. I mean, there might be the occasional research student. But other than that, going to the zoo really is a group activity. Now, why is that? I reckon it's because when you see something amazing and the zoo is full of amazing things, you want to say to someone, hey, did you see that? Look at the gorilla scratching its bum. A bit like you, Dad. Or, or look how long that giraffe's tongue is. It's so weird. Or, or how lively that snake moves along the ground. Or maybe it's a question. Is there actually an animal in this enclosure? And what do you think that bear is thinking about as it looks at us around lunchtime? Relationships, connection with other people, conversation with other people makes life better. I think that is inarguable. Life is better when shared with other people. And we all know this. Some of us might know this experientially because we enjoy a rich array of relationships. Others of us might know it the hard way because we feel lonely or isolated. And if there's one thing that all of us have struggled with in the long uh, stretch of the pandemic, as far as church is concerned, it's been the restrictions to our ability to, to come together, to connect with one another. And that's why we're so very keen for you to make the effort required to gather in one way or another. One plus one, gather in a gang, watch and worship, however you can do it. We just think relationships in life are inarguably important. And of course, they're central in the life of the church as well. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, the apostle Peter just rolls out kind of relationship after relationship and sets out the prevailing attitude that we ought to adopt if we're a part of that relationship. And you can see that just as you scan down the passage in 1 Peter 5. Uh, to elders, be shepherds. To young punks, be submissive. To everyone, be humble. Uh, towards the devil, be alert. And so today we're just going to work our way through those relationships to see the attitude that we ought to bring to each. That's the plan of attack. So the first relationship is introduced there in verses 1 and 2. Let's read them together. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. And so what he's really saying is to elders, be shepherds, which is all good and fine, but we're going to need to work out what Peter means by each of those terms, because he's not appealing to retirees to become farmhands. So elders is a term that really refers to church leaders. The same word in the original language can be translated as bishops, but it doesn't have in mind serious looking chaps in frilly robes and dresses because they didn't exist back then. It, it's local church leaders who were called elders because they were typically older in age and wiser in sensibility. Of course, that doesn't mean that every older person is wiser or that every church leader needs to be older. It's just what they were called in name. But Peter is calling them in purpose to be shepherds. That's the task at hand. And also overseers watching over their people, verse 2, exercising oversight. And that phrase, be shepherds of God's flock, 
you'd remember it's highly reminiscent of what Jesus said to Peter at the end of John's gospel. You remember, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. It includes the function of teaching and preaching, of pastoring and praying, of organizing and decision making for the sake of the people within the local church. Be shepherds of God's flock, watching over them. Now, personally, I think it is quite intriguing how Peter cages his appeal because I'd be tempted to say, look, guys, I'm the Apostle Peter, the rock. You might have heard of me, the one upon whom Jesus said he would build his church. Jesus right hand man. I mean, I'm not perfect by any means, but but I am fully restored like a 67 Mustang. And I need you to get on with this job. Will you do that for me? But he doesn't. Instead, he appeals to them as a fellow elder. He doesn't pull rank, but he gets alongside them. And he also appeals to them as somebody who has seen the suffering of Jesus up close. And again, I think that's interesting because he could say, you know, I was amongst the first who saw the risen, resurrected, triumphant Lord Jesus who powered over death itself. But he references the sufferings of Jesus. Of course, he notes that he will share in the glories that will accompany Jesus' return. But I wonder if his peer-to-peer approach and if his reference to being uh, a part of Jesus' sufferings are designed to say to the leaders in the fledgling little churches dotted around Asia Minor, I get it, guys. I get it. I get there are lots of reasons why you might want to shirk responsibility. I mean, we're being opposed. You know, the, the environment around us feels hostile towards us, even when we're trying to live a good life. And that's just outside of us. You know, within our little groupings, there is perhaps unrepented sin and unresolved conflict and unacceptable behavior. I I get why you might want to draw back rather than lean into your leadership role as shepherds and overseers. I get it. I truly do. But this work before you is important work. So I'm appealing to you as a fellow elder to get on with it. And as I think about it, I don't think the situation they faced is all that different to us today. You you think about in previous decades, church going in Australia was normal and ministers were respected figures within society. Now church going seems to be a, a quaint pastime and ministers are irrelevant at best and potentially dangerous figures at worst. There's lots of reasons to draw back, but every generation needs a new crop of church leaders who want to lean in rather than draw back. And I wonder if you should be a part of that, if that's something that's possible uh, in the position of life that you're in. And, And maybe it's not you, perhaps it's your children or your grandchildren who might hear that call to be a shepherd or an overseer. And how will you respond to the enthusiasm that they might show? Will you willingly support them in that? Or will you subtly give them good, sensible reasons to draw back and to pursue something else? You know, even within our denomination in this great city of five million people, there's a desperate need for children's ministers and youth ministers and adult ministers, both men and women. Beyond our great city, there are needs across our whole land. And as the gospel explodes in South America and Africa and Asia, there are big opportunities for trained ministers. Should you or could you be a part of that somewhere or even encourage those within your sphere of influence or even just not dissuade them when they sense the call of God upon their lives? Elders, says Peter, be shepherds of God's flock that is under you. Now, more quickly, Peter provides three contrasting sets of motivations or dispositions that shepherds, overseers, uh, leaders bring to their work. So there in verse two, not because you must, but because you're willing. God doesn't want begrudging obligation. He wants leaders with willing hearts. In fact, even more than willing hearts, verse two again, he wants eagerness, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. You know, it's true that ministers can do this job as a job just for the money. For sure, ministers shouldn't retire either as paupers or as multimillionaires, but it is possible for us to still harbour modest middle-class aspirations and greed. And so shepherds be keen to serve, 
not keen to steal. And the third contrast is, uh, I think, really an action rather than an attitude. Verse 3, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. The role of shepherd, overseer, leader is a decision-making role. It, it does require the exercise of authority over the future directions of the church, which means it has an impact upon the people within the church who ought to submit to rightful authority. There's no two ways about that. And with that authority, there is always the possibility that a leader domineers or dominates people. You know, I've worked for uh, Andrew Graham, Bruce Clark, my past and my current boss for nearly 20 years now. And I've never heard either of them raise their voice. Not once in 20 years. Do you, do you know what I think that is? deafening and for me personally quite an example to follow which is how the apostle peter would have it willing eager examples not begrudging greedy overlords oh and by the way there is a special reward for the leader who does all this says verse 4 a winner's crown presented by the chief shepherd Jesus upon his return. It's an eternal, unfading one, which I think refers not just to eternal life, but to that special reward that's given to a faithful worker who has persevered to the end. And so elders be shepherds. Well, we'll move on quickly. So secondly, in, uh, in verse 4, we see in the same way, or continuing in the same subject, I think he means, you who are younger... Submit yourselves to your elders. In other words, young punks, be submissive. Now, of course, it's not the case that uh, younger people are the only ones who need to submit to their leaders who are willing, eager examples. We've all got to do that. But perhaps Peter singles out younger people because there's just a shadow, just a, the tiniest shadow of a temptation for younger people to think they know everything, or at least better than their foolish older Forebears. I mean, just a whisper, hypothetically at least, right? I mean, I've, I've just heard a whisper of that. With three teenage sons in my house, I have absolutely no experience of this whatsoever. And so young punks, but really all of us, be submissive to our church leaders rather than rebellious or dismissive. And that very quickly brings us to the third relationship, which is addressed to all of us to be humble. Uh, have a look in verse 5 there. All of you, verse 5, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Now, I live a few doors down from Nolan's playing fields in North Manly, and every Saturday in winter and uh, every Friday Arvo during the touch footy season, there are quite literally thousands of kids playing games on Nolan's fields. How do you find your team amongst thousands of panting, sweating, kids well it turns out it's not that difficult you just look for your jersey so uh, brookvale fc for example they're in the light blue jerseys though we all know they're dirty players manly fc are in the maroon and white harbord are in the the red and blue jerseys with the white sash the white strap Curl Curl are in green and yellow, and the Bellrose Terry Hills Raiders, well, let's be honest, we're just glad if they managed to put their pants on at all. Clothe yourselves, he says, all of you with humility. And I think uh, Peter is really saying that humility is, it's, it's our team kit. It's the jersey we put on. Uh, it ought to be something we can recognise each other by. And you can see there in verses 5 and 6 that we humble ourselves before one another or towards one another because God gives grace to the humble. And quoting Proverbs 3, verse 34, God opposes the proud. I mean, you could say it in this way, be humble and God will be with you. Be proud and God will oppose you. Or perhaps even more simply, just be humble or God will humble you. Clothing ourselves with humility towards one another means we don't always have to be right. We don't always have to win the argument or get our own way or have our personal preferences preferred over what might be for the good of the many. 
It means being able and perhaps even being quick to apologise. It means being able and perhaps even quick to, um, to forgive without holding ongoing grudges. It means being willing to serve, even if that service is not high profile or it's not highlighted, or you don't get the same kudos and respect that you might be used to in your regular line of work. So be humble towards each other. And as the passage moves on, we see that same humility should be applied towards God. Let's read verse 6 together. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. So what does humility look like as it's applied towards God? Peter suggests that giving over our fears and our anxieties to him in prayer is one way. I mean, what a wonderful little verse is verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Is, is that a verse that speaks into your world this very day? Either because you're filled with anxieties and fears, or perhaps for the opposite reason, because you reckon you've got it all under control. You know, don't need to bother God at the moment. I am large and in charge here. You think at the end of the day, at the start of the day, Prayer is not a last resort. Before we get professional advice, before we Google the answer, before we consult our wise friend, before we lean into our own personal ingenuity, we pray. I mean, what does prayerlessness suggest other than, I don't need you, God, right now. Thanks, but no thanks. I am good for the moment. What idiotic people we can be. We're here warned that God opposes the proud. We're encouraged that he gives grace to the humble. We're reminded that he will lift us up when the time is right, not immediately before we've had a chance to learn some lessons and grow, but when the time is right. And we know that he cares for us. So why is it that we don't pray again? So all of you, really all of us, be humble towards God and to one another. Now this... Uh, this brings us to the next relationship, and it's really a bit of an interruption to the flow so far, and certainly a contrast in the attitude that we've just been encouraged to adopt towards one another, because there's no meekness required in our disposition towards the devil. We're very clearly told to be alert. Well, let's read verses 8 and 9 one more time together. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Let's go back to the zoo. Best part, by a long way, is the big cats. I mean, I, I like the reptiles too, don't get me wrong. But my all-time favourite animal is the lion. King of the jungle, king of the beasts. Such limitless capacity to destroy, I find them captivating. I would love to own one. I'd love to take it for a walk along the beachfront in Manly. I'd love to freak out all the dog owners. It'd be fantastic. One time I was at the zoo and uh, one of the magnificent lionesses got down off her little porch thing and sat at the very front edge of her enclosure so that her face was almost pressed up against the glass. Got a picture of her here. Uh, that's my son, James. He is still cute. He's just bigger and a lot more expensive these days. Anyway, these little kids, not James, by the way, little kids came up to the glass and started banging on it uh, right in front of her face and then turning back to their parents and laughing. And I watched them as they did that for about five minutes, I guess, and then out of nowhere, quick as lightning, she stood up and she swatted one of her enormous paws at the glass right in front of these snotty little kids. And I just wonder whether that's a helpful way of thinking about the devil. Real and roaring, capable of bringing both inward temptation and external suffering. I mean, he can, he's involved in both. And yet also resistible. One that cannot harm us if we are alert and sober. Much like the lioness behind the glass couldn't really harm those kids. He can be resisted if we're alert to inward temptation. If we're sober, both metaphorically... But I also think literally, because it's hard to resist Satan if we're given to drunkenness or even frequent tipsiness. Did you know, 
uh, verse 9, that Satan has been resisted by the family of believers, that is, other Christians across the world, all down the ages, which partly reminds us that we are not the only ones going through temptation or suffering and persecution. It's entirely common and it's absolutely resistible. Uh, in fact, James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's as though he is both a roaring lion and a timid kitten, depending on what your natural way of thinking about him is. For those who dismiss Satan as a figment of the imagination, a cartoon devil, a caricature, he is a roaring lion and he's got a killer appetite. But for those who give him too much power, either thinking uh, you've got no option but to give into temptation, or you just fear him unduly, he is a timid little kitten, resistible entirely. And in fact, one who will run away from us if we are determined, alert and of sober mind. And so, friends, there are four relationships with four attitudes or four dispositions that we bring to them. Uh, elders or leaders, perhaps even potential leaders, be shepherds and overseers. Young punks, be submissive to your leaders. All of us be humble towards God and to one another, for humility is our team kit, it's our club jersey. And lastly, towards the devil, be alert and resist. Now that's a lot of instructions, isn't it? Lots of things we can do, which some of us really like because we're practical people that like getting busy. Some of us might resist it a bit because it sounds like Peter is asking us to do a lot for God. Well, he is. But he finishes, most importantly, with words about what God has done for us. And Christians, there is lots that we are asked to do for God, but it is never more important than, it's always based upon, and it is always in response to what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And so we read verses 10 and 11. And the God of grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. And with those verses, the Apostle Peter draws this punchy little letter to a close. We've been instructed to stand firm in verse 9, but at the end we're reminded that it's God who will make us firm. We've been asked to endure suffering, unjust suffering, suffering for being a Christian, but at the end of the day we are reminded that that after we have suffered just a little while, you know, long enough to learn to rely on him and develop perseverance, it's God who will restore us and make us strong. We've been told to be humble, submissive, alert. But at the end of this letter, we are reminded that God is about grace, his undeserved kindness towards us, and he has called us into an everlasting glory, echoing those opening words of the book, which describe us as God's elect exiles, chosen according to his foreknowledge, filled with hope whilst we are here, away from our heavenly home. Well, let's finish. Relationships in life, they're inarguably important. In fact, they make life better. And of course, relationships are central in the life of a church too. But at the end of Peter's letter, and really at the end of the matter, it's relationship with God that is of the greatest import. He is about grace. He has drawn us into his everlasting and eternal glory because all that Jesus has done for us in his obedient life, his sacrificial death and his triumphant resurrection. And between then and now, he will restore us and make us strong whenever we suffer in weakness. Friend, that is a, a, a vital and a life-giving relationship. That is a living hope. Indeed, that is hope away from home. And I commend it to you.
to spend the next few minutes doing something really important together, and that's leading us all in the Lord's Supper. Who knows what the Lord's Supper is? Where you drink bread and wine. Mm. That's right. And Christians have been doing this, sharing a meal, as a symbol for the last meal that Jesus shared with his friends before he went to the cross. And we do it to remember that Jesus died for us and also to celebrate all the things that he achieved through his death and resurrection. So his victory over our sin, his power over death, uh, the promise of forgiveness and the hope of new life with him. Before we get started, any questions? Um, What's with the bread and juice? Well, uh, when Jesus ate the last meal, he gave them bread as a way to symbolize his body and so that they might remember that he was going to give his body up to death on a cross. And the juice he passed around in a cup. uh, And he did that to remember that in dying, God was making a promise to forgive anyone who asked him for it. And so one of the things that's good to do before we eat and drink together is to say a prayer of confession. Do you guys know what confession is? Confetti? Confetti? Is it where you've done something bad but nobody knows, then you confess? Yeah, that's right. And uh, we've all sinned and done the wrong thing when it comes to our relationship with God. And so it's, um, it's right that we say sorry to him. Uh, which is what we're going to do now. And uh, Rubes, if you'd like to lead us in that prayer of confession, the words are going to come up on the screen. And so you can actually pray these along with us uh, wherever you might be. Thanks, Rubes. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And the great news is that when we ask for God's forgiveness, he promises to give it to us. Yeah, that's great. Okay, everyone's going to need to get their bread and their juice ready um, because we're going to eat and drink in a moment. I'm going to read a short passage from the Bible and then I will tell you when we're ready to eat and drink and then we're going to finish off by praying the Lord's Prayer together. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So everybody, take the bread. Brothers and sisters, eat this in remembrance that Christ gave his body for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take the juice. Brothers and sisters, drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. We'll finish now by saying the Lord's Prayer together. This is the prayer that Jesus used to teach his disciples how to pray. The words will be on the screen and Jackson is going to lead us in it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been a great day together, hasn't it? Just a couple of things from me before we wrap up. These COVID times are hard for many people. Uh, St Matt's has lots of ways of providing confidential care and support for people who are in need. So please do ask if you need help. And if you know someone who needs help, urge them to get in touch. You could simply use the Connect card to leave your name and a phone number, and I'll make sure that someone is in contact with you very soon. But today we've come to the end of this little series in God's Word to us from the book of 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter is written for people whose lives are filled with troubles and turmoil. But it's a letter filled with certain and wonderful hope. It's certain because it's built on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So as we wrap up this series, Let's hear this very positive close to this most helpful of books. 1 Peter 5 verses 10 to 11 says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen.